Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate uh, seeing you all here, especially sort of at the end of, I guess, at the end of the conference. I uh, hope you enjoyed yourselves. Um, my name is Doug Carson. I am the Senior Manager for Enterprise Networking at the University of Toronto. So my group is responsible for the uh, university's core network, uh, which is, um, involves about uh, 600 departments. Uh, we are also responsible for the uh, wide area network, which uh, links a couple of uh, satellite campuses and, of course, out to the internet. And uh, I also am responsible for another organization that's called GTA Net, which is a, a network that links all the universities, research hospitals, uh, colleges in the uh, Toronto area. And then uh, lastly, and of course uh, important to this talk, is that my group also handles the, uh, the wireless networking at the university. Um, so what I hope to do today is uh, give you a bit of uh, insight into some of the, the strategies and perspectives that, uh, that we've had over the, uh, over the years uh, deploying our wireless network. Um, it's a very, uh, deploying a wireless network, of course, is, is a very uh, challenging, especially with an institution our size, which I'll, I'll give you some insight into. Um, I often find that with uh, conferences like these, that you know, a presentation like this gives you nuggets of ideas to think about. And um, because of that, uh, the, the, uh, what I find the most beneficial is when there's an opportunity to, for discussion and that sort of thing. The, the real ideas that one gets sometimes is just the, the sort of one-on-one -on -one talk. So if you have any comments or you have any questions during the presentation, you know, feel free to interrupt me be happy to um, you know, try and answer or uh, discuss anything that uh, you know, comes to mind. So let's see if I can get this to work. The uh, universities, the challenge of size and numbers. We have both. From my perspective, at least, what I, I believe are some of the, uh, the major challenges that educational institutions face are, are threefold. First of all, there's a density of users. We have a lot of people in very small spaces. And the expectation, of course, is that they can use the Wi-Fi technology and it will just work. In a, you know, you could say that a, a conference like this, for instance, there's a, a lot of people in a, in a relatively small space, but the primary focus here is not so much to you know, be on your laptop or your, your iPhone or something. It's, it's, it's a, if you were to lose the service, it would be an inconvenience, but not, it, it's not one of these things where you would necessarily just go home. In the case of a, a classroom, where you have a, a whole bunch of people, and the professor is trying to you know, teach a course, and he tells you to pull out your uh, iClicker app and you know, vote on this particular thing, the expectation is that everyone will be able to do it, and it'll just work. So, there's, there's that problem, and then there's the, the problem that, uh, the, the follow-up problem on that is that uh, not only do they require simple applications like that, but oftentimes they'll require you know, high bandwidth applications, like for instance, some sort of multimedia presentation. And this, this, um, this adds to the complexity of things. And finally, uh, it's the range of devices that need to be supported. Uh, we don't control any of the devices that come onto our network, and so, we're faced with, uh, well, first of all, the BYOD problem, uh, where we have to be able to support, to some extent, just about everything that comes in. And we see devices from you know, the Far East and that sort of thing that nobody's ever heard of over here. Uh, but there's also other things that uh, uh, universities and colleges deal with, specialized research activities. We have departments that are running autonomous robot systems on our wireless network. Uh, they require special things. And then, of course, there's the, uh, lately what's been coined, the Internet of Things. So that's things like uh, we have uh, you know, security cameras, wireless lock systems, and so on and so forth. That all, they, they all want a piece of the wireless network. So these are all challenges to us that I think, although you can find them elsewhere in industry, I think they, they, they all come together in a university environment, which makes things you know, much more complex when we try to you know, deploy that tech, uh, the wireless technology across our campuses. I want to give you a, a quick, that being said, I want to give you a quick introduction to the uh, University of Toronto. Uh, we were founded in 1927, so it puts us about 180 years old, not the oldest institution in Canada, but certainly one of the older ones, uh, as King's College. Uh, we've now grown to be uh, Canada's largest institution. We have uh, just over 100,000 uh, students and faculty and staff, so 100,000 people on the campus. 
Uh, we have three main campuses, one to the uh, east side of Toronto, one to the west side of Toronto, and of course the central one down um, in the downtown core, which is the, uh, the St. George campus. Um, if you've been watching the Pan Am Games, you would have seen the, uh, uh, the diving and that sort of thing. You would see the uh, Aquatic Centre, which is our Scarborough campus, which is the campus to the, uh, to the east. That was the, uh, that's where that building was. Uh, we offer uh, everything under the sun in terms of uh, programs, engineering, computer science, arts and science, fine arts, uh, literacy, or <laughs> not literacy, uh, literary studies, sorry. Um, we also have pro uh, professional and uh, graduate courses. Uh, we do about one point, oh, this is an older slide. Uh, I didn't update this properly. Uh, we do about $1.3 billion worth of uh, research um, in, uh, from that year. Uh, we have the third largest library system in North America. And important to, I guess, a wireless deployment, we have about 300 buildings to cover, which uh, is a, a major uh, challenge in itself. And the buildings themselves, of course, are, they range from uh, buildings that were built in the uh, sort of the mid-1800s all the way up to the, uh, the glass and chrome stuff that you, uh, you know, see today. So there's a whole range. A lot of the, um, the campuses... Uh, uh, were built in the uh, 60s. This is the uh, Scarborough campus. So most of that was built in the 60s. That's uh, largely poured concrete. Um, some of the newer buildings. This one down here, the Arts and Administrative Building, is interesting because it's all clad in copper, so it's one big Faraday cage. So it's a real, again, you know, challenges. This is the uh, campus to the west side of the city, again, uh, built in the 60s. Uh, range of uh, building styles, but again, some of the, uh, the new modern buildings and so on and so forth. And then the, uh, the St. George campus, which is the main campus, the downtown campus. Um, the University College was the original building on campus. That dates from about uh, the uh, 1850s. Uh, the Robarts Library, which is uh, built in the 60s, the poured concrete uh, monster. And the uh, as an example of a recent building, which is the uh, Center for uh, Cellular and Bio, uh, Biomolecular Research. You can see where this is going, eh? <laughs> so, prior to 2009, uh, wireless was, we got started, I guess, in wireless in, in the uh, very late 90s, um, you know, very sporadic deployments. It wasn't until about 2002 that we uh, actually put together a plan to try and implement some degree of coordinated wireless. And the, the way the, the plan was uh, put, um, the, the center, that is uh, my group, which is the central services, uh, was going to pay for half of it, and departments pay for the other half. At the University of Toronto, we're sort of, uh, we're kind of like the, uh, the Game of Thrones, except without all the beheading. Uh, it, it's a lot of little fiefdoms. Every department is a little fiefdom in itself. And uh, so we run up to a DMARC point in that department, and then from there on, it's the department's network. So the departments get their own IT budget, and they, are, uh, they were responsible for paying half the cost of putting out a wireless deployment. We would pay half, they would, be, they would pay half, that was the incentive for them to, to go. The problem with this was that you know, the richer departments, the ones that uh, had, the, had the money, or, you know, they would go ahead and do this, but the departments that, you know, didn't see the benefit of it or didn't have the, the money uh, didn't do it. So what we ended up with was a whole bunch of islands of IT, or uh, wireless support, I should say. Um, and the problem was that the way that the whole thing was funded, we, it was done over a long period of time, so there was multiple generations of the technology. Uh, it started off basically with AB support. Some of the later generations supported G, but the only thing we could reliably support across the entire campus was AB. Uh, there was no centralized management system, so we'd have to go out and uh, if there was ever a problem, you'd have to send someone out on site. And in the, uh, the, the latter years, uh, the, these things were good. We had, uh, well, with 1,000 APs, which we ended up with eventually, um, we were finding that, you know, there'd be maybe anywhere from 5 to 10 APs that would go down a day. So I had a couple of field service technicians running around every morning trying to fix these APs. Just, uh, sometimes, it was usually just a, a power reset that you had to do, but you still had to send someone out to do it, which was a, a you know, big time waster, I guess. Um, the authentication was done through a captive portal system. 
Uh, you had to log in. That meant if you moved from building to building and moved off one network onto another network, you had to re-authenticate. It, uh, it just wasn't a very robust or good solution to anything. Um, and the, the final challenge, as I mentioned, is that a lot of the APs were installed on departmental networks. So we were having to uh, get IP space from them, or there would be some element of you know, interaction that would cause problems. We just found problems with it. So in 2009, we made a, uh, after a lot of lobbying, we uh, finally made a strategic decision to proceed and just replace the entire wireless network with something that actually worked. The idea that I sold them on was the idea that we were going to provide a ubiquitous coverage throughout all the buildings and where it made sense in outdoor spaces as well, across all three campuses. The uh, project also included building a, a dedicated network for wireless. And uh, the funding for the project, most importantly, and especially important to the departments, uh, was that we were going to pay for it all. So they were very happy with this, especially, the, as, I, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a, uh, a number of uh, departments, or, or actually, uh, there are actually universities within a university where they typically don't get any money. So they, they're what we call the federated colleges. And um, the, so the fact that we were deploying infrastructure in their buildings made them extremely happy because usually they don't get any money from us, that everything is, is uh, their responsibility. So the, uh, everyone was uh, very pleased by the fact that uh, we were able to uh, get this uh, through. When we wrote our RFP for all this, uh, we looked at a number of different products. And, uh, but the idea in general was that we focused on uh, what I mentioned, trying to solve the problems at the beginning, which was for high density and uh, performance. And of course, uh, you know, ease of use and deployment. The strategy that we used was you know, fairly simple. Uh, we uh, figured uh, we would do it in three phases. First, replace all the legacy equipment. Second one was to start deploying new uh, technology, a building at a time, because a uh, building is a nice uh, chunk to work with, and it, um, it uh, just it, it makes sense in terms of the uh, deployment and the, the interaction of the, the, the way the devices work to, to do it a building at a time. And then the final phase was to go back and fill in any you know, dark corners or spots that we'd missed uh, and do any outdoor spaces, anything left over. Uh, our focus was on uh, uh, basically twofold. One was to improve the student experience. So the first things we wanted to do was improve the student experience. The second thing we wanted to do was enhance any uh, of the, uh, the learning uh, processes, make, uh, make it easier for the uh, professors to, uh, to teach their courses. So the, the first thing we did was we uh, upgraded the Wi-Fi networks in uh, the buildings where we saw the most students. So the first thing that got hit was the libraries. So that's the, uh, the, that Robarts library that you saw, uh, we deployed uh, just over 200 APs in to start with. Uh, it was one of the first buildings that we did. We did a lot of the other uh, uh, major libraries as well. Uh, we also focused on the, uh, the arts and science buildings, the uh, engineering computer science, and uh, so on. And then, of course, we did other, uh, you know, sort of what we might call side projects. Again, uh, but trying to do an entire building at a time where, it, uh, where a professor had a particular interest in and his, uh, his course was such that they could gain an advantage by having a Wi-Fi deployment available to them. We, had a, we have a, a number of uh, very large uh, lecture halls and that sort of thing. And that's what I mean by the challenging projects, uh, that we decided that we we're going to hold off as long as we could until we got a good understanding of how the technology worked and what was the, uh, how we wanted to uh, implement the uh, solutions there. So we held off on those. Uh, even though there was a lot of demand for services in those buildings, in one building in particular. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that we improved the, uh, the back-end infrastructure. That was uh, very important, that we uh, wanted to make the whole experience much easier to, uh, uh, for everyone to work with. This is, this is where uh, things uh, started to get interesting. So we have 300 buildings. I have a general idea 
of how much it costs to put in wiring for a, for a, a drop in an AP, but I have really no idea how many APs are going to be required in all these buildings. And these buildings vary in size from absolutely huge to, you know, houses, essentially. So uh, I tried to estimate what, uh, what we, how many APs we might uh, use to come up with some sort of budget for this whole thing. So we looked at the, the, the only thing we could do is, is look around at some of the other institutions uh, that were in similar size to us and try and extrapolate from what they had. So we looked at uh, a couple of places, uh, McGill University in Montreal, uh, University of British Columbia, uh, noted how many APs they had, and uh, from that came up with the idea that we'd probably need about 3,000 APs. And with that number, then we looked at uh, what we knew how much it would cost to put in the wire uh, on a per drop basis and came up with the idea that it was going to cost us about $5 million and we could probably do this over three years. It seemed like a good idea at the time. But then, as you, uh, if you've done any wireless deployments yourself, you probably know uh, we hit the, uh, there was a bit of a, a knee in the curve. We hit uh, the 2012-2013. All of a sudden, everyone uh, decided that uh, Wi-Fi was a good thing, and they wanted it. What this did was it meant that uh, more people were carrying more devices, so we had to put in more APs to be able to support the uh, user densities. Um, they required a higher signal strength because they wanted greater throughputs than uh, what had originally been designed for. Um, the back-end hardware had to be upgraded, increased, to uh, be able to support more devices. Uh, we started running into resource issues, and I'll, you'll see in a, I have a chart on the next slide, which I'll, I'll, you can see quite clearly some of these things. Um, we basically ran out of resources in my group in terms of uh, trying to uh, implement the, uh, the uh, do the, the project management for the, uh, the, the project and all the, the work involved in that. But we also ran out of uh, resources in our contractors. They were not able to provide enough people to, uh, to handle the work that we were giving them. So things really started to bog down. Uh, this basically uh, threw everything into uh, any of my uh, original calculations basically out the window. So here's what things looked like. You can see the, uh, the project back at the uh, beginning, 2010. We had 1,000 APs. We had uh, supported ABG protocol, so on and so forth. Uh, 7,200, that's the number of concurrent sessions, so that's the number of people we saw on the network at any one time. Every person was carrying approximately 1.15 devices. And they were using about, a peak, they were using about 200 megabits worth of traffic. 2012, 2013, we grew the number of APs fairly linearly, up uh, three times. Uh, we'd replaced all the APs by that time with the, uh, the, uh, the new products. Uh, using the, that all supported the ABGN at all locations. Uh, the, the two uh, campuses to the east and west, uh, Mississauga and, and Scarborough, we were able to do fairly quickly. They're relatively small, relatively easy to do. Uh, the number of users increased fairly linearly, so it's about three times the number of APs, three times the number of sessions. But you can see the number of devices that people are carrying is starting to creep up. The other interesting thing is that uh, if you look at the total users, again, it's fairly linear, but look at the amount of traffic that they're using. They're now using 10 times the amount of traffic they were using the, uh, basically the uh, couple of years before. Then that's the inflection point. So that's when the, the resources bogged down. You notice we only added 600 APs in that following year because we uh, were, got heavily resource constrained. We started to deploy the new AC APs that were available at that time. A um, little bit of expansion in terms of the uh, St. George campus. The other ones are, I'd say, expanding because they keep building new buildings that we have to cover. But look at the number of users. The number of users jumped from 25,000 to 42,000. And everyone's now carrying just under two devices. The traffic level has also increased by 50%. You go up to the, the, uh, the latest stats we have are from uh, this, uh, this past uh, March, which I'm sure is the same sort of thing for you guys, that uh, you see your, your peak traffic probably in, uh, like us, probably in, in October, November, then in, in uh, March, April time frame. Uh, we hit 65,000 uh, users on the wireless network. Um, the, the number 
of uh, APs and the number of uh, users themselves has grown fairly linearly, but the, uh, the number of concurrent sessions has, uh, has increased dramatically and you can see the, probably the reason why is because now everyone's carrying more than two devices. Uh, just out of curiosity, does anyone typically carry, any of you guys typically carry more than two devices around in your wireless network? Yeah. I, I, I myself carry two devices. I carry an iPhone and an iPad, but uh, what, what are the, what's the third device that you carry? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, it's, it's going to be interesting to see in the coming years how much that number actually starts to increase. Yes? It is a, uh, it's a, it's a single SSID. Um, we actually, it's, it's, we support the edge room, which is a, uh, which is a, a guest access. But I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, we do have um, different types of authentication that you can use. So I'll talk about that a bit in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you if you look at the uh, the types of traffic that you uh, on the network, uh, you know previously uh, most of the stuff was HTTP, and now you're starting to see streaming video as being the the big. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the problem with wireless is it's a shared resource, right? And uh, if uh, you it it. And that, that's one of the things that uh, is, a, is a, certainly a challenge, is, is making people understand that it is a shared resource. Um, one of the things that, of course, you know, everyone wants to do is uh, try and get as much as they can on the wireless because it's very convenient to do. So you have you know, wireless signage and everything like that, wireless signage, streaming videos. They don't quite understand that, although it's cheap for them, it means that it uh, causes problems for everyone else because you lose that capacity. Um, this is what we're seeing in terms of the, uh, the usage, in terms of the, the types of devices. Uh, most of the devices, a uh, good chunk of them, at least almost 40% are the Apple iOS. And then you have about 20% of Android devices, 20% Windows devices, and about 10% uh, of the uh, uh, you know, Mac OS devices. And the other ones are probably things like Linux devices, things that we uh, you know, don't, or have been categorized as, as others or unknown Blackberries, things like that. Yeah. In what sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the nice thing, yeah, the, the nice thing for us is that because we're in the uh, the downtown core, the uh, central hub for all communications for the. Um, for Canada happens to be just down the street from us. And so we have dark fiber down there, so bandwidth is not my problem. I can throw as much bandwidth at the problem as I want. It's cheap for me. I can buy bandwidth really cheap, so I don't worry about that part of things. Uh, we have all dark fiber that runs down to this. Um, I have multiple strands. Uh, it's the, the bandwidth is, is the, the one nice thing about my life is I don't have to worry about bandwidth. Our satellite campuses are connected at 10 gig. All, our, all the GTA net members that we have that I mentioned are all connected at 10 gig. Um, we're actually talking, because we own dark fiber, we're talking about uh, in places moving to 100 gig technology where it starts to make sense. We have some high performance research computing and that sort of thing which would take advantage of that. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice with the, if we look at the protocols, um, you'll see that there's now we're starting to move away from the 2.4 gigahertz band into the, uh, the majority of traffic now is moving on to the 5 gigahertz band, which is, I think, is a good thing because the uh, 2.4 band is so uh, congested. Um, the, it's interesting with the, uh, the 11 AC because um, only a, a, a relatively small portion of our APs now support it. So I'm going to be interested as we start to, all the new APs that we're putting out all support a, uh, 11AC. And as we start our refresh cycle, we'll be refreshing the existing APs the, uh, that only support up to N. We'll be uh, replacing them with the AC. So it'll be interesting to see how that number changes. So what sort of challenges did we face? Well, uh, first of all, you know, I think size and scale, that's uh, fairly obvious. We have uh, about uh, 9.7 million square feet to cover. 
of space. And that's just on the St. George campus. I don't have uh, good stats for the, the other two campuses, but uh, they're about, uh, each of them is about, uh, in terms of the uh, student population, is about 20% of the size of the, of the main campus. So you can sort of extrapolate from that as to what, that, uh, what those numbers might be for the other two campuses. Building construction, uh, a lot of you know, historical, architecturally significant, so they don't like uh, putting these big ugly APs up against and these uh, you know, beautiful neo-Gothic buildings, so you have to find creative solutions for that. Um, the, uh, some of these old buildings you know, have three foot thick walls that you have to get through. Uh, they are uh, modern buildings. They, they can be uh, RF opaque, like that, uh, that one at uh, uh, Scarborough that I was mentioning, it's, it's all copper. Or even uh, the, uh, the glass on these modern buildings, the low E glass, is RF opaque because it's, it's a metallicized uh, glass. Uh, but one of the biggest and most costly problems is a lot of our buildings were built in the 60s, so they're full of asbestos. And um, especially our, our, uh, one of our, our major buildings, which is the medical sciences building, is completely asbestos, so much so that uh, when we wired it up, we had to use wire mold below the ceiling because it just, you just couldn't get up in there. It's, it'd just be uh, too dangerous, too costly to, uh, to do anything uh, other than that. Uh, large classrooms, uh, we have uh, lecture, large, very large classrooms, the 300 to uh, 2,000 seat. I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of those later. Uh, they uh, required some you know, customized solutions. And the, uh, the fact that, at least in the downtown core, uh, we're surrounded by foreign Wi-Fi networks. Now, that was a concern at the beginning. Actually, it turned out in the end that it really wasn't much of a problem. That the, uh, we only found, uh, off the top of my head, uh, one uh, situation which uh, was a shared building where we had a dentist office. And they had some sort of wireless camera, I think, that was a security camera that was streaming. But it wasn't using a standard... Uh, dot 11 protocol so it took us a while to to actually find that uh, but when we did find what the problem was the the wi-fi was working horribly in that area it was just a simple matter of switching channels and the problem was uh, cleared up but uh, in, in terms of you know dealing with foreign wi-fi it wasn't as much of an issue as we thought it might be initially so some of the uh, the technical challenges these are probably fairly obvious um, the network architecture, the, uh, the logical and physical design of the network. You've got to um, move a lot of traffic around, uh, especially uh, the, the fact that uh, when you're using a centralized controller, you've got to, um, everything's coming back to uh, various concentration points. Um, ensuring high availability. The, uh, the wireless network you know, quickly became uh, like any other network these days. If it's not working well, I'm just going to shut my uh, system down and, and, and go home. Uh, this is an interesting one, the consumption of public IP4 addresses, uh, or sorry, um, yeah, it's going to actually, yeah, it is an interesting one, the, the, what I was really wanted to say was the, the next one is the really interesting one. The consumption of IP4 addresses, when you start hitting, you know, 65,000 addresses, we were very blessed in the, in the fact that we started with the internet very early on, so we have a, a lot of address space. And, but when you start using up an entire class B for your wireless network and you, you're looking at your users and they're using, uh, they're carrying more than two devices now and you've got a you know, potential of 100,000 users, you've got to do something because it ain't going to last. And you know, I, I, we, we have a lot of uh, address space, but we don't have that much address space. The, uh, the next one, one the, is a very interesting one, hardware limitations. Uh, we found that the... Uh, we, we originally started off with, uh, at least on the uh, St. George campus, concentrating all our equipment in, in two locations. Uh, that was to provide some sort of redundancy solution and uh, just to, uh, to uh, make the, uh, the system a bit more fail-safe. But what we found was that we had so many addresses coming into and so many MAC addresses coming into the, uh, these concentration points that we started to overflow the tables in our switches. So our switches, the, the bridging tables, they started to, the switches started to act like hubs. And the routers, we were coming very dangerously close to filling the, uh, the uh, cam tables in them, the, uh, the ARP tables. And uh, if you know, that had uh, uh, happened, then everything would have, uh, the whole system would have slowed down, not just the wireless network, but all the, uh, all the uh, other uh, networks connected to these, uh, these core routers. 
So we, we had to find a, a solution to that, which uh, was eventually actually just create a third node, move things off, uh, put in switches that had uh, bigger capacities in terms of their bridging tables. But uh, it was something that uh, really caught us off guard. It's something that we didn't expect at all. And then, of course, the uh, uh, tunneling traffic back to a central set of controllers. The concern I have there is that the traffic speeds and feeds are getting so much you know, higher, especially with AC, where you have the potential of you know, uh, gigabit connectivity in the future. That's a lot of traffic to be bringing back to a central point. And uh, you, so the, the network has to be, uh, well, first of all, it has to be robust enough to, t to, to handle that. But going forward, you have to start looking for solutions where you can distribute that more so that the traffic is, is being dealt with more locally than trying to uh, bring it all back to uh, the same central point. In terms of the RF design itself, um, you can optimize in uh, any two of three dimensions. Uh, coverage, the other dimension, was really not a problem because we had to put up enough APs to be able to uh, you know, cover all these little small rooms and things like that, so that wasn't it. But then tuning the performance and capacity from that uh, was uh, sometimes a, a challenge. We had to find ways to support specialized applications. Uh, as I mentioned, our computer science uh, department has these autonomous uh, robot systems. Uh, we have command and control services like uh, the, uh, the wireless lock systems, uh, security cameras, and so on. And the, what started to uh, come into the forefront recently is the university has made a decision to move off our legacy Centrex system onto some sort of voice over IP. And of course, uh, they're now telling me that they want to run voice over IP on the, uh, the wireless network. So we've got to, uh, I think we're, we're probably, because we've dealt with some of these other things, we're, we're probably in a pretty good position, but you know, we'll, we'll see how it, it actually goes when, we, uh, when push comes to shove. And then, of course, the uh, security and authentication. The, uh, that's, uh, that's always a challenge, especially when you have uh, your, uh, your paranoid security group uh, versus uh, the end users who want as much pro uh, freedom as they can possibly get in terms of uh, connecting any device and anywhere and anyhow to it. The, um, the major challenge that we had was, uh, at least I had, was uh, trying to uh, keep the project on track. As the as we started to roll it out and people started to see how well it was working, I was getting emails from uh, very, uh, very powerful people in the organization saying, we want to be next. But in terms of the deployment sense, it didn't make, it didn't make sense because it wasn't going to give a lot of benefit to you know, a, a large majority of the students. It might be a, you know, a, a small theater or house or something like that that um, they, they were pushing me to do. When, you know, with a limited set of resources, you, you've got to make sure that you uh, focus on the, and continue to focus on the areas that uh, will give you the most benefit. So that was a bit of a challenge, you know, getting back to these people, you know, putting them off, saying, you know, that I'm going to have to, you're just going to have to wait. Uh, we will get around to you, promising them that, and so on and so forth. But uh, it was, uh, sometimes it was a, uh, a bit of a challenge to handle some of these people. Um, the other thing, of course, is managing the expectations. As I mentioned, you know, people said, oh, you're putting in wireless? Great, I'm going to put up these uh, wireless display boards and, and use up all your bandwidth for that. And I said, well, if you do that, then your students are going to have a lousy experience, and so on and so forth. So we had to you know, convince them that it's not like wired. And, and especially uh, you know, the, what you often see out in the industry is people you know, comparing that, uh, the, the wireless network to being like the wired network. So the users think that um, it's gonna, you know, when you get 80 to 100 people on this wireless network, that it's going to operate just like their home network, and it's going to be simple, and everything's going to just work well. It isn't quite that uh, simple when it gets to the uh, large enterprise side of things. I mentioned the fact that uh, we needed to support uh, the, every type of device. Uh, we saw, um, certainly uh, early on, we saw a lot of problems with some of the, uh, the Apple products in terms of the uh, Athos chipsets uh, being able to uh, work properly on the network. Um, so you know, there was a, a lot of uh, work done to uh, you know, find the right drivers, find the right combinations, incantations to, uh, to get those kind of things to work. Um, we're certainly uh, dealing with the uh, security policy. So we, right now we have uh, authenticated, uh, we have sponsored, which is where someone like a professor or a staff member says uh, they can create a, a temporary ID. 
But there's a lot of push now for public access. That is like the, the Starbucks type model where you just walk in and you connect to the network. Well, the security group absolutely hates this idea. All the end users absolutely love this idea. They, they want it. So there's, there's this push back and forth. Of course, I'm caught in the middle trying to find the right solution between the two of them. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the fact that uh, a lot of uh, during the summer, as I'm sure uh, possibly uh, a number of uh, you um, experience as well, the, the residents turn into hospitality. So we have uh, a number of our residences turn into sort of hotel type uh, accommodations uh, that are uh, either rented by the, uh, the day, the week, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's uh, trying to find um, you know, solutions for, for their particular needs. And of course, doing all this and making sure that everything just keeps running because the expectation is that everything will keep running. Nothing stops. So, how do you eat an elephant? I think we qualify as an elephant. <laughs> this is at least how we, we did it. Uh, first of all, uh, start with the basics. Uh, we hired a, a dedicated project manager who had extensive experience with uh, RF deployment. And then we created uh, around him a, a cross-functional team uh, which involved uh, people from my uh, network design group, which is the, uh, the group that does the, the core router configurations uh, and so on and so forth, the, the sophisticated networking, and the implementation group, which are the people who uh, go and put out the switches and configure the, uh, more of the, uh, the N-type uh, networking equipment. The, uh, the, uh, they're the people who uh, you know, deal with the fiber networks and so on and so forth. Uh, we brought them all together uh, to work on this project. Uh, we also leverage uh, site-specific resources. So the first thing we do when we do a new building is we actually go in and talk to the people in the building and find out how the building is used, what the, um, where the concentrations of, of, of people are. I mean, you can, look at it, you can look at a floor plan and you can see that, well, this, this classroom is a large classroom. It has you know, 200 seats. You know, you know what you're going to have to put in there. But a lot of times you'll find areas in a building like a, a hallway or something like that, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, the, well, the students typically congregate in this area. So that's a, a place where you look to add more capacity because you know that there's going to be a lot of people in that particular area. So it's, it's understanding how the building is, need, is used. Uh, sometimes, you know, there'll be a, a storeroom downstairs that they say, we don't need any coverage there, no one ever goes in there. Or sometimes they'll say, yeah, we need coverage in there because there's people in there who are working on, you know, something that needs uh, access to the, uh, to, uh, the Wi-Fi network. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, once the, the uh, scope of work has been done for a building, then we leverage the, uh, the actual local facilities managers to actually handle the project from there on. So we write up the scope of work, we hand it to them, they find the contractors, we just approve it uh, based on the, uh, the quotes that we get back from them, and they deal with it. Uh, the so that's, again, offloading resources that uh, I have to uh, multiple resources, which made things uh, run much smoother than we trying to manage the whole thing ourselves. Um, we also uh, use uh, a lot of external resources. I found that, um, for instance, when you do the, uh, the, the predictive studies, that uh, it's, it's a fairly simple process to do uh, once you understand what needs to be done. And we found that it was uh, very uh, inexpensive just to hire a student to do that. And he just sits there all day and takes the floor plans that we have and um, lays out the, um, the, the wall materials. He, he goes out and actually uh, looks at the, uh, the buildings and finds out what type of materials there are and uh, he, lays these, he lays them out. And uh, so we've been able to crank off a lot of floor plans very efficiently. And then the other thing is uh, making sure that we use contractors that actually have experience with installing Wi-Fi equipment. So, Earlier on, when we started, we were finding that uh, the contractor would come in and he'd install an AP, but he'd st install it on the side of a, uh, a ventilation duct. So you've got this big metal uh, thing running down with an AP on the side. Well, it was great on one side. Of course, it completely shadowed the other side. So uh, having a, a contractor who understands how to install what the, what the implications of uh, Wi-Fi propagation are and that sort of thing can, can certainly uh, benefit the process and, and, and make things uh, much smoother. And also, uh, just in general, uh, you know, cover for any uh, omissions or errors that you might make in, in terms of your design 
when they they, get, they might get up in the ceiling and see something is here and uh, instead of having it right there you can they, they can either advise you that it needs to be moved or move it themselves if it's not too far and so on and so forth so that that can be very uh, beneficial to the deployment process um, as I mentioned, yeah, we, we, uh, in terms of the RF design itself, we uh, determined where the uh, uh, users uh, were going to be. Um, most of our, our uh, site planning is done through uh, predictive analysis. We do, um, we do go out to the building, as I mentioned, uh, and look at uh, what the materials are on the walls and that sort of thing. But there are certain areas, too, that require actual you know, site visits and uh, doing some RF measurements. So you put up an AP and uh, you see what kind of signal strengths that you're getting from it. And uh, so there actually is some, in, in uh, certain areas, there are uh, you know, some requirements for that. Uh, we're, we're currently designing to a, uh, a minus 65 uh, dBm signal strength. In practice, it's always better than that. that. That would be at the fringe of the coverage area because we have so many of these APs to be able to cover typically all these small rooms or even the, uh, the large classrooms that getting better signal than that is, uh, is it's the norm. The, uh, the minus 65 is, as I said, at the fringe and uh, the hope is that that at least will cover the, uh, the needs of things like the voice over IP that I talked about earlier. Uh, the channel allocation. Uh, we take advantage of the, um, the fact that the technology that we're using, the Maru technology, has the ability to uh, both uh, stripe channels and layer channels. So striping is uh, putting, uh, it's a, the Maru technology is a single channel architecture, which uh, you may or may not be aware. So we'd put on, the, say, the first floor, we'd use uh, one channel on the, or one set of channels uh, in the uh, 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. On the next floor, we'd use a different set. On the third floor, again, a different set. And the fourth floor, then repeat you know, what we did on the first floor. So you get a layer of channels. In a classroom, you can do the same thing, except in the, the space of a classroom itself. So this gives you a way of giving um, you know, very high density uh, deployments, and it's, it's actually worked very well for us. Uh, the last thing we, we did is we basically got rid of uh, the 11B. There's no off switch for 11B, but the interesting thing that we found is that there is a way that you can tell it that uh, what the minimum signal strength it is, uh, or the minimum, uh, sorry, uh, connection speed that it will allow. So the maximum speed on 11B is 11 megabits. So we told it, don't connect for anything less than 12. It effectively turns it off. Uh, 11B, is, as you may or may not be aware, uh, very much slows down a, a, a wireless network. So, and when we, when we decided to turn it off, we looked at the number of devices, and out of those um, uh, 25,000 odd devices that we had out there, I think three were connecting with uh, 11B. So it was a no-brainer. The uh, network architecture that we use uh, in terms of the, uh, the physical network, uh, what we did was we created a completely separate network for the, the wireless. Now, the, when I say separate, it, it's separate from the departments. It all runs over the same core network, right? But instead of uh, connecting to um, a departmental uh, switch, we now have a, a separate switch in there that we uh, run all our um, APs on. This allows us to... Uh, put in PoE switches just specific to, uh, to the um, particular needs of the, uh, the wireless network and so on and so forth and do whatever we want in terms of the uh, configuration. Um, importantly, we run two cables to every location because installing a cable is expensive. A cable itself is really cheap. So if you're going to put in one, it doesn't cost you much more to put in two. And the advantage of having two is that um, you can, in the future, if you need it, you can bond uh, the two interfaces together. You can um, add another AP if you need more capacity. It just gives you a lot of flexibility for a, a, a relatively uh, low cost. Uh, the, the type of cable that we're currently deploying is the uh, CAT6 cable, and we deploy it, we try to keep the lengths down to about 60 meters. So the idea is that in future, we'll be able to run uh, 10 gigabits off of that cable. 
And there are certainly other uh, technologies that are just on the horizon that uh, will, you know, incrementally uh, step between the current uh, one gig that we have on our uh, our current uh, systems up to the uh, the 10 gig. So uh, we see it as a as a good longer range solution. Uh, logically, we uh, separate the various user communities onto uh, different VLANs. We don't really do anything with them other than the the Internet of Things VLAN, which we take off to a, a separate. Uh, network uh, for our facilities and services group, but we do have that separation. So uh, when you log in, the, uh, your radius authentication determines whether you're a student or a staff or a faculty, and we put you on a separate VLAN. So we do have the potential of uh, pr uh, applying some sort of traffic management to those uh, to specific user groups if we want to. Uh, we use uh, logical uh, network layers to uh, separate the uh, inbound and outbound traffic so that uh, basically everything uh, goes through an intrusion prevention system. Uh, the, the wireless traffic itself goes through the NAT and any other traffic management systems that uh, we want to put in place. Uh, we, we finally bit the bullet when we hit 42,000 uh, real IP addresses and went out and bought ourselves a, uh, a carrier-grade NAT solution, even though I'm not particularly fond of NAT. But uh, anyway, it was something that, uh, that had to be done. The decision so far to support IPv6 is that we're going to do it uh, natively, that we're not going to do any sort of translation on uh, IPv6. We're just going to pass it straight through. We haven't turned on IPv6 on the, uh, the wireless network yet because uh, we are essentially out of capacity in our current uh, generation of uh, core routers. So once we upgrade our core routers, which is uh, a plan my group is working on now, uh, then we should have the capacity, so we'll uh, enable uh, native IPv6 at that time. The other thing that we're looking uh, to do is to provide um, SDN to uh, uh, give us the, uh, the quality of service control for the, uh, the voice over IP network. And uh, actually, in, in terms of the, uh, not only just the wireless network, but also the, uh, the physical network, it's uh, uh, we're starting to run proof of concepts now, but the, uh, the idea would be that uh, we can overlay our own quality of service over a departmental network that we don't control using the uh, SDN. Uh, so it gives us uh, basically a end-to-end uh, -end control of the quality of service over a network that we don't control. So we operate it in a hybrid mode. And I, I've actually uh, seen it uh, on the wireless network. I've seen it demonstrated in the lab. And it works very well. I've seen it you know, take a, a very uh, dirty uh, video that is having all sorts of lag problems, and you switch it on, and it just cleans it right up. It's, it's quite impressive, actually, how well it works. Uh, in terms of security and authentication, we got away from the captive portal. We're not using any captive portals right now. Everything is done through uh, uh, the uh, .1x authentication. Um, as I mentioned, we do use uh, separate user communities based on the, the user's ID. Um, all our clients, of course, are, are basically BYOD, and uh, so we, we treat them as external to our, uh, to our network. Uh, the actual, the, the way the, um, the wireless network sits, it sort of logically sits between the Internet Gateway and the, the rest of the university's core network. And Either way it goes, it, it has to go through the IPS. So we protect the, <coughs> excuse me, we protect the outside world from us, and we protect what we see as the outside world from the, from the internal networks uh, that way. The actual uh, security uh, in our network is, is all based at the, uh, around the departmental edge. So the, uh, we, we do a sort of minimal filtering in terms of the, the core network. We, we get rid of the, the garbage coming into the, uh, to the main network, but uh, the, the really hard uh, security stuff is done closer to the, uh, the actual uh, edge of the network. So I promised I'd talk about uh, some complex RF designs. I just want to, uh, this is uh, probably the, the most mathematical slide. Well, it is the most mathematical slide that I have. Uh, I just wanted to give you an example of what it took to, what it takes to, you know, uh, handle a large classroom. If you take a, as an example here, we have a 250 seat classroom, and uh, you assume that everyone's going to be using about two devices, and that you can support 80 devices per radio, and you have two radios per AP. Uh, you work that out, and you, you crunch that down, you, get, you need about three APs. 
However, if you want to support high definition video on that, and you assume that high definition video, and this might be a high number, but it's the number that we've uh, used uh, for uh, in a number of uh, different occasions, six megabits uh, plus an email at a half megabit, you work all that through, you end up that you need about uh, 1.6 gigabits of throughput, and going down, you need 17 APs. So 17 APs in a room maybe this size, that's very hard to deploy. So a more reasonable strategy is to look at the idea of supporting standard definition video. Um, and if you go through the math on that, you end up with about four APs, which is very close to your three APs that you originally started with. In practice, we are now deploying about six APs in, the, in that same room. To, uh, and this just works out well in terms of channel allocations, also gives us some uh, future capacity growth. And also uh, allows for some degree of you know, higher throughput uh, requirements, like the, uh, some degree of high definition streaming and so on and so forth. The, um, I, am, I am very blessed in that the staff I have is extremely uh, technical. They're, they're a, a really smart bunch. Um, and as an educational institution, I think uh, the other thing is we tend to be rather cheap in terms of uh, going to uh, outside contractors, at least I don't know about you guys, but certainly we are. And so we only hire people uh, outside when we absolutely think that we can't handle a problem. But there are three areas where I, uh, I would strongly advise that uh, it's, it's worthwhile looking at uh, uh, some professional services. The first one is when you first start deploying the network and you get a reasonable number of APs and things out there that you have something to, to work against. Uh, during an audit, having someone a, come in and do an audit of your network, was uh, we did that and it was extremely beneficial. Um, it was just a matter of things like tuning the network, turning down the uh, things like the, the thresholds on uh, received signal strengths so uh, uh, and, and, and broadcast uh, strength and that sort of thing so that uh, devices weren't seeing you know, on, on uh, a building on the other side of the street and then trying to connect to the APs in that, which they obviously couldn't do, uh, things like that. So the, uh, having um, that sort of uh, thing done was, it was certainly very beneficial in terms of it just you know, getting an understanding of the tuning of the network. Um, we also uh, used it to uh, analyze and, and mitigate some complex ar operational issues, which was, the, uh, as I mentioned, at that, that uh, dentist office. And, um, some, uh, and then the uh, various complex RF designs, which uh, uh, the Convocation Hall, which uh, uh, and the, um, the Goldring Center for High Performance Sports, the field house, uh, I'll just uh, quickly show you these things. So this is Convocation Hall, uh, built in uh, 1904, uh, houses uh, 1,700 seats. You can see the, uh, the um, bowl there. It's uh, used for a variety of purposes. We managed to squeeze uh, 29 APs into that uh, space and basically provide that uh, uh, standard definition throughput for everyone, uh, <coughs> excuse me, up to two devices. So 3,400 devices can uh, stream at uh, the um, full standard definition um, video. We've uh, so far seen 1,800 concurrent sessions in that uh, building. And then there's the, uh, the Goldring Fieldhouse. This was actually used as a practice facility for the, uh, the Pan Am Games. The, um, it seats 2,000, the, uh, the floor around the uh, outside there, the floor, can, uh, those seats actually retract and you can put uh, seats on the floor and that sort of thing. The design that we had uh, there, again, it was uh, done by the professional services, required 20 APs and we used special uh, panel antennas to, uh, to focus the uh, signals into the, uh, into the area to keep the, uh, the, band, the, uh, the spread on the bands uh, narrow. So I'll give you some final thoughts for what they're worth. Um, I was trying to figure out a good way to, to summarize everything, and the, sort of the best I could come up with is the, the catchphrase, don't compromise. Uh, it's something that I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that we uh, typically followed. Um, obviously, wireless has become a, a key component of, the, uh, of networking. Uh, as I said, uh, if uh, people don't have it these days, they get uh, very frustrated, uh, very angry. Um, I get all sorts of nasty emails when there's problems. They, uh, they expect it to work and just work. 
Uh, so how do you do it right? Well, you've, you put good people in charge of your project. You find the right people, people who have knowledge. Um, make sure that you plan for, uh, for growth and manageability. To some degree, I would certainly advise you to overbuild things because uh, the, uh, the cost of a, an AP is very inexpensive, but the infrastructure to support it is, uh, is relatively expensive. So you really want to do it once and you don't want to have to uh, keep coming back and doing it over and over again. So pull in the two wires instead of the one as the example. Uh, obviously use the expert uh, services where you can. Uh, take advantage of that. And the, the other thing that I'm still uh, trying to get uh, firm budget on is, is equipment renewal. So we're getting to the point now where we've been at this thing for about five years, uh, going into our sixth year. Um, some of the older stuff is now needing to be replaced. Now, I don't have a specific budget for that, but I still keep getting money. So they, they keep giving me money. I'm going to have to start spending it on... Uh, on renewing some of the, the older stuff because it's, it's starting to get uh, a bit on the, the legacy side. Um, but the, the problem for me then is that when I spend money that way, now I have to justify the fact that I'm spending it you know, specifically on renewing the infrastructure as opposed to expanding the infrastructure. So um, something that I'm still working on trying to, uh, to get through. And the final thought is um, make it easy for the end user. Uh, put all the complexity behind the screen. Um, that's uh, very important. I, I keep telling my guys all the time when they come up with this uh, whiz-bang solution that you've got to make it easy. It's got to be simple as pushing a button to make things go. So thank you very much. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.